Hello and good afternoon everyone. So we are here on our next topic, which is our uh, chapter 1.5, because it is somewhat contained in our first chapter, the research methods in biopsychology. So biopsychology research methods study the human brain, and thanks to them, it's now easier to understand how uh, the most mysterious organ in our body, which is the brain, works. So, but what exactly are these methods? So biopsychology research methods have evolved in the last decades. Okay, so these would be our topics to be discussed. So specifically, we have a major part, which is the methods to study the nervous system. And it's following uh, subtopics would be brain imaging and brain stimulation techniques. We have here uh, in human, living human. We have here the uh, psychophysiological techniques. We have here the invasive physiological methods the neuropharmacological methods, and the genetic engineering. So we'll be talking all of this in a while. Okay, so let us now first talk on the behavioral methods in biopsychology. So uh, if we are talking about neuropsychological testing, what comes in your mind? So we can pertain this specific topic or a specific uh, area under psychological assessment. And one of the tools that is used in psychological assessment is the psychological tests okay so mind and brain are its portal so neuropsychological tests tests are specifically designed tasks uh, used to measure a psychological function known to be linked to a particular brain structure or pathway tests are used for research into uh, brain function and in a clinical setting for the diagnosis of deficits uh, suspected of having brain damage so may mga specific type of test daw tayo na that consider that in neuropsychological testing na it can be done through paper and pencil test or activity test and may, it may already identify an area of the brain or a deficit in the brain where there may be a problem okay so arguably the next part here is the behavioral methods in cognitive neuroscience when we are pertaining to the cognitive neuroscience we are talking uh, primarily on brain imaging techniques technologies and methods that is used to study the brain itself, its function, and its activities. So the major goal of behavioral neuroscience is to show how neurons in a specific brain uh, look like can lead to psychological functions such as learning, memory, and attention. This is primarily done by using changes in behavior in animals in combination with the selective brain manipulations to make inferences about the role of neural system in mediating a specific psychological function. So tinitignan natin dito function through imaging. Okay? So we also have here the animal paradigms. So when we are pertaining or talking about the paradigms, we are talking on the patterns or the frameworks or the ways on how these specific animals may go on their day to day. So this uh, pattern of behavior are usually the guide or the usually the usual or common to different types of species. But some of them can be relatable to one another, but some of them can be specific to an individual. Okay let's proceed so these are the imaging and stimulating techniques that is used to uh, learn or talk about the living brain of a human so as much as possible ginagawa to kapag buhay pa yung tao or yung brain natin na functioning pa okay so uh, amongst the indicated in the lists so ang binigyan lang natin dyan na powerpoints or presentations or pagkakinanlan ay yung mga sumusunod sa contrast x-rays. So here we already define the contrast x-rays as a method uh, of studying an organs using x-ray and the administration of a special dye or jobos, DYE, which is called the contrast medium. So when a contrast x-ray is used specifically for the head or for the brain, it is now called a contrast medium. Uh, it's called now a cerebral angiography. So angiography is generally the contrast x-ray method. Kapag ginamit ito sa brain or sa ulo, sa utak, it's already called as cerebral angiography. So we are talking about the cerebro or the uh, cerebral cortex. Next, we have your computer tomography. Uh, I think you are already familiar with some of this. The, uh, we have here the magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, positron emitting tomography or the PET scan. We have here the functional MRI, fMRI, the magnetoencephalography or MEG. We have here the transcranial magnetic stimulant or stimulus. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, 
Now let us talk on the CT scan first. So for us to understand this, so this is usually a tool that can be seen in our uh, hospitals. No? Para saan ba ito ginagamit? So para makita muna namin or maintindihan natin kung anong function yan. So the CT scan uses several X-ray images and computer processing to create cross-sectional images or horizontal sections. Again, it uses several X-ray images and computer processing to create cross-sectional images. So usually, ang duration ng pagkandak nito ay 30 to 60 minutes and ang resource nito ay usually 2 to 3 days bago ilabas. Uh, meron siya mga specific conditions na pwede niyang ma-diagnose or conditions it may diagnose such as irritable bowel movement, fatal liver, uh, gallstones, yung uh, bato sa abdo, uh, lung nodules, no, mga uh, maga, maga or pabukol-bukol sa ating lungs, cancer, and more. So, it is a non-invasive technique or method and its ability to confirm a condition or diagnosis is high. So, a x-ray scanner is rotated 1 degree at a time over 180 degrees. So, computer reconstruction, uh, nakikreate na image, then tulad ng sinabi ko kanina, cross-sectional to horizontal sections sa pwedeng i-produce image and reveal structures such as abnormalities such as cortical atrophy or lesions caused by stroke or trauma. Kapag pinabanggit natin or nakikita natin yung term na atrophy, no, ang ibig sabihin nito ay shrinking. No? So kapag sinabi natin cortical, ito ay yung cortex natin, cerebral cortex. No? Nagkakaroon ng shrinking yung brain natin. If you can see here, this uh, and on the right, this is an image produced by a CT scan. No? Kung makikita nyo dyan, uh, medyo close to yung ano, yung hole dyan sa gitna, tapos close yung parang dalawang line. No? Parang naka, ano siya, smirk na mata at saka bibig. No? So, medyo may problem yan kung ganyan. Ang ibig sabihin, nagsishrink yung brain niya or lumiliit. So, usually nangyari ito kapag uh, old age. Okay? So, it can reveal stru structural abnormalities also when it's caused by trauma or stroke. No? Sa stroke, so makita natin dyan yung lesions, yung mga damage na nangyari. When we are talking about lesions, may wound. No? Merong uh, pwedeng rupture within the organ. So, it can also identify uh, aneurysm if you are familiar with that term. Okay, now we will talk about the MRI scans. So, MRI scans, on the other hand, is another scanner but it does not use uh, radiation. It uses magnets. So, MRI starts, uh, stands for uh, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So, it uses a very strong magnet. So, ano bang ginagawa nito? MRI scans provides precise details of your body parts, especially soft tissues such as your brain, no, with the help of magnetic fields and radio waves. Again, it provides precise details of your body parts, especially soft tissues, with the help of magnetic fields and radio waves. So it is a type of uh, uh, imaging technique that is also non-invasive. Usually 15 to 90 minutes ang pag-administer nito, ang duration niya rather, and ang mga conditions na pwede niya diagnose or conditions it may diagnose are the following. So it may diagnose stroke, uh, liver cirrhosis, hepatitis, traumatic brain injury, cancer, and more. Okay? Again, it's non-invasive and its ability to confirm a condition and ability to rule out a condition is high. So, but reliable to. So, when a radio frequency wave is passed through the head, so atomic nuclei emit electromagnetic energy. So, yun yung dinedetect ng MRI, inaabsorb niya itong atomic ener uh, electromagnetic energy no? na ini-emit nitong mga molecules. So, the computer reconstruct the image afterwards. So, ito yung nakikreate niya ang image. Now, we can uh, look on the side-to-side -side, uh, comparison between the MRI and the uh, CT scan or CAT scan. So, okay. So, ano ba yung mga basic natin nalalaman na differences nila? So, CT scan, ito yung image na produce ng CT scan sa taas and the MRI, ito yung produce na uh, pinapakita dito sa baba. Kung makikita nyo, mas clearer yung images na kaya ma-produce ng MRI. No, mas defined yung details kaysa sa CT scan. So, what are the other advantages? So, the MRI do not have ionizing radiation exposure. So, if you are not familiar with radiations, so extreme amount of radiation is very dangerous and can cause cancer to the skin or to the, uh, to the body rather. So, ionizing activity can alter molecules within the cells of our body. So, that action may cause uh, eventual harm such as nga, cancer. No? So, intense exposure to ionizing radiation may produce skin or tissue damage. So, ano ba yung mga waves na medyo dangerous at very 
a high amount. We have here the radiation from alpha, beta, and gamma rays from radioactive decay. Kaya nga minsan, uh, risky yung uh, work mo kapag ikaw ay exposed sa x-rays, such as yung mga rad tech natin sa hospitals, no? Okay? So, it has, it, uh, MRI also produces a better spatial resolution, or yung resolution na pinuproduce niya ay mas precise or makikita natin. It, it can produce horizontal, frontal, or sagittal planes, where in horizontal lang, no, at saka cross-sectional yung pwede i-produce ng CD scan. So, ano naman ang disadvantages ng MRI? It's more cost, no? It's very costly compared to CD scan, no? Uh, and, uh, ano yung sinabi ko dyan? No ferrous metal. Since the MRI uses a very strong magnet, so people with implants of metal, specifically with iron, even yung mga titanium teeth, yung mga implants sa kanilang bones, are not eligible to use MRI. Why? Because pwede kakosto ng damage sa kanilang body parts or it can uh, cause increase in temperature within their body. No? Itong mga bakal na to, no, pwede silang mamagnet ng MRI which can cause damage. So, hindi sila pwede dito. Yung may mga bakal sa ngipin, yung may mga braces, no? hindi pwede basta may ferrous metal or may iron na uh, na-attract ng very strong magnets. Okay? Uh, now, we would go to the PET scan no? or positon emitting tomography or PET scan. So, PET scan is an imaging test that uses radio tracers to assess organs and tissue function. Again, PET scan uses uh, is an imaging test that uses radio tracers to assess organ and tissue functions. So it is also an imaging technique. No, ang duration niya usually ay 2 to 3 hours lang, pero ang results niya usually lumalabas ng almost 1 to 2 days. Ano ba yung mga conditions sa pwede nitong i-diagnose? So pwede siyang mag-diagnose or maka-identify na brain tumor, pwede siyang maka-identify na Alzheimer's disease, which is a type of dementia. Uh, it can also identify coronary artery disease, heart failure, cancer, and more. No? So, ano ba ginagawa ng PET scan? So, meron tayong ini-inject dito na tinatawag natin positron-emitting radionuclide in a form of deoxyglucose. Itong deoxyglucose na to, kahit ito ay type of chemical, it is not an invasive type. So, since it's a form of a glucose or sugar, so, ina-accept ng body natin. And positrons, no? These positrons from the scanner interact with the electrons which produce photons. If you know photons, photons are the molecules of light. No? specifically in gamma rays that travels in opposite direction. Yung PET scanner natin, i-detect niya itong mga photons na to, and the computer determines how many gamma rays are from a particular region and map is made showing areas of high to low activity. No? So, makita dito sa baba, uh, lower right, makita dito, ito yung PET scanner ng brain. No? PET scan of brain rather. So, we have here the normal, kung makikita nyo, andyan yung may mataas activity, normal brain. Next, we have a mild cognitive impaired uh, brain. So, mild uh, or uh, slight memory uh, dysfunction and speech disorder. So, and yung pinakalas, which is medyo natatakpan ko kung makikita nyo, napakalipis na ng halaw niya, uh, meron niyang Alzheimer's disease. No? Nag-depreciate na yung kanyang uh, brain activity. So, there is a problem. And pwede yung ma-identify ng PET scan. Okay. Now, we would try to differentiate PET scan versus CAT scan. Okay, so CAT scan uh, shows brain structures. Uh, PET scan reveals brain activity. Okay, so structures mainly ang CAT scan, no? and PET scan uses brain activity. CAT involves absorption of X-rays, yung C C uh, CT scan. PET involves emission of radiation by injected inhaled isotope, no? in a form of deoxyglucose or 2-deoxyglucose. Okay, so let's remember that. Next is the functional MRI. So, functional MRI is the higher form, again, of technology that was made recently. So, ano bang ginagawa nito? So, the main function of functional MRI is to measure the blood flow to assess brain activity. Again, measure the blood flow to assess the brain activity. Blood flow is also termed as brain hemodynamics, especially kung ito ay sa brain. No? So, the images, it produces images, uh, brain hemodynamics. Okay. So, its duration for conducting is almost or about 1 hour. So, ang results niya ay available within a week. So, ano yung mga conditions sa pwede niyo ma-diagnose? Epilepsy, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and Alzheimer's disease. It's also non-invasive in a form uh, as a technique. No? And its ability to confirm a condition is high. And its ability to rule out a condition is also high. No? So, anong advantages sa fMRI sa PET scan? So, no injections are needed to be given. So, makikita mo dito, hindi lang yung structure, kundi pati yung function. No? And meron tayong tinatawag na shorter imaging time. 
mas mabilis nating ma kukuha yung image, no? And it has better spatial resolution. Kung makikita niyo dito sa picture natin, iba-ibang perspectives yan, no? Pero kuha-kuha yung details at saka meron pang brain hemodynamics wherein ito yung part ng brain na talagang medyo may blood flow at may activity na masasabi. 3D images yung magagamit natin. So if you want to check up more with this fMRI methods, you can go to this uh, website, www.fmri.org dash fmri dot html. Okay? Let's proceed. So we also have here the magnetoencephalography. So magnetoencephalography uses the magnetoencephalograph. So ano ba yung ginagawa nito or ginaga saan ba ito ginagamit? It is an imaging test that uh, reflects the activity of the brain by scanning the magnetic field and produce magnetic source image. Again, an imaging test that reflects the activities of the brain by scanning the magnetic fields and producing a magnetic source image. No? Okay, so it measures changes in magnetic fields on the scalp surface that produce that is produced or are produced by changes in the patterns of neural activity. So, brain activity rin yung tinitignan niya. So, ang duration ng pagkandak nito usually ay 1 to 2 hours and usually available ng kanya results uh, 30 to 60 minutes. So, ano ba yung mga conditions sa pwede niya ma-diagnose? It can diagnose epilepsy, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and some neurological disorders, etc. No? Again, epilepsy, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and neurological disorders. So, it is not invasive. It is a non-invasive technique. So, ano ang advantages naman ito over fMRI? Kung nakikita nyo, pinag-compare-compare natin sila every now and then. So, it has faster temporal resolution. Mas mabilis lumbas yung kanyang uh, imagery, temporal resolution. <clears throat> if you're familiar with EEG, electroencephalogram, no? it has uh, also advantage to it. It has greater accuracy and more reliable localization or identification of the part due to the minimal distortion of the signal. Yung EEG, ito yung may mga nilalagay tayo mga nodes dito ng uh, electrode, electrodes. No? May nilalagay tayo dito mga, ano, tapos yung mga wire-wire na nakasabit. No? So, it, it can be used in clinics usually. It, uh, it has many clinical uses rather. So, ang isa sa mga use niya sa clinic is the evaluation of epilepsy. So, it is used to localize the source of epileptic form or yung area na brain wherein andun yung uh, too much activity that causes seizures or epilepsy. So, usually performed with simultaneous EEG or electroencephalogram. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, now we will go to the trans, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. So, TMS uh, is a non-invasive procedure that uses magnetic fields then to stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve the symptoms of depression. So, usually ginagamit to for a treatment of depression. Again, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation is a non-invasive procedure that uses magnetic field to stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve symptoms of depression. So, TMS typically is used when other depression treatments haven't been effective. Kung medyo nagkakaproud na tayo sa pharmacotherapy, psycho, uh, bio, psych, uh, pharmacotherapy or pharmacy, ph pharmacological treatments, so gumagamit tayo ng TMS for depression. No? Okay, so ano bang ginagawa niya? Paano bang nagagawa niya? So, it disrupts neural activity by creating magnetic field under a coil positioned near a skull. So, ano bang cause ng depression? So, kung ito ay biological cause, so nagre-release, nagkakaroon tayo ng over-secretion ng tinatawag natin dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter and a hormone. No? Over-secretion or over-production of this hormone such as dopamine and cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone, can trigger the, uh, depression. So, ang ginagawa nito, TMS ay dinidistrap niya yung activity nila, yung too much activity nila at pinapakalma. Sinasabi niya, hey guys, calm, calm down. Okay? So, repetitive TMS is typically used when standard treatments such as medications nga is not uh, working. No? Or even yung psychotherapy kapag hindi nag-work. Okay? So, ayan. It can also use to treat or identify neurological uh, or mental health disorders. It may improve the symptoms, okay? So, dinidisrupt niya yung specific cortical location. Uh, produce, uh, it use, uh, this, there is a disruption of specific cortical locations, which is produced while participants engage in cognitive and behavioral tasks. So, this allows a researcher to uh, identify the function of specific cortical areas. Okay, let's proceed. Now, we go on the psychophysiology. So, hindi ko na sila ginawa ng isa-isa pang PowerPoint or isa-isa pang slide, pero we can identify them one by one. Okay, so first we go to the electroencephalogram na nabanggitin natin kanina or EEG. 
So EEG can determine the changes in brain activity that might be useful in diagnosing brain disorders such as epilepsy or seizure disorder disorders. It can also be helpful for diagnosing or treating uh, disorders such as brain tumor, brain damage from brain injury, uh, brain dysfunction that can uh, have a variety of causes such as yung encephalopathy or inflammation of the brain or encephalitis, stroke, uh, sleep disorders. So, yan yung E. EG. Ito yung may mga nodes dito. Na, ng, may mga nodes dito sa ating mga ulo na may mga wires-wires na kinoconnect. We also have here the electromyography. So, your doctor may order an EMG if you have signs or symptoms that may indicate a nerve or muscle disorder. So, it is used to identify a nerve or muscle disorder. Such, uh, such symptoms may include tingling, parang tusok-tusok or may manhid, numbness, muscle weakness, nangihina yung muscles, muscle pain or cramping, no? If you could, uh, if you know someone, di ba, minsan yung kapag nagka-cramps yung paa nila or yung legs nila, medyo gumagalaw-galaw pa, pwede itong makatulong. Itong EMG, no? So, necessary to para makatulong. So, next is the electrooculography. So, electrooculography naman is used, is a technique used for measuring corneoretinal standing potential that exists between front and back of the human eye. So, it uh, measures and looks on the eye movements no there record niya yung uh, eye movements and it can be used in of ophthalmological diagnosis okay next one here uh, we have the electrodermal activity no electrodermal activity is usually is also sometimes called as galvanic skin response again uh, electrodermal activity or the skin conductance is usually called as galvanic skin response so ano to so, electrodermal activity is the property of human body that causes continuous variation in the electrical uh, characteristics of the skin. Electrodermal activity or EDA, which is known as skin conductance or galvanic skin response, is when the skin conducts electricity through sweat glands and can tell us a lot of what is happening on our emotions or state at the moment. For example, may something na nagpapakaba sa'yo, sooner or later may marirelease na sweat sa inyong fingers. No? or yung temperature ay medyo hindi okay, pwedeng may tinatawag tayo na nagbabasa yung kamay natin. So, ang nagtitest nun ay yung uh, electrodermal activity. So, may identify nun kung there is a possibility that we are anxious, no, etc. So, we also have the cardiovascular activity such as running in the treadmill. Na minsan may mga kinoconnect-connect din tayo na EEG. So, they go hand in hand. So, I think you are familiar with naman with the ECG, no, or EKG. So, ECG or the EKG is, also, is usually termed as the electrocardiogram. So, electrocardiogram gram or electrocardiograph is usually used to measure electrical activity of the heart to detect cardiac problems. Again, so uh, the electrocardiogram EKG or ECG measures the heart rate or the electrical activity of the heart to detect cardiac problems. So, it is it is usually done in 15 to 20 minutes and almost immediate na makikita yung problem. So, ano yung condition na pwede i-diagnose? It can diagnose arrhythmia, no? Ito yung mali yung beating ng heart natin na medyo irregular. So it can identify the coronary artery diseases, arteries, and it is also non-invasive, no? But its an its ability to confirm a condition is low to moderate only. So, but its ability to rule out a condition is a moderate to high. Okay? So I think familiar naman kayo sa blood pressure. Ano ba yung ginagamit natin para makuha yung BP natin? If you are familiar, yung may pinapump, it's called spigmomanometer. Again, spigmomanometer. So, kinukuha nun yung systolic at saka diastolic nyo. No? Makikita nyo kung yung blood pressure ay high enough or very low. Okay? So, also, we have here the plethysmography, also known as the pulse oximeter. So, kung nakita na kayo ng plethysmograph, kapag kayo ay nagpapavaksin o pumunta sa RHU, meron silang something na kiniklip dito sa daliri natin, tapos sinihintay nyo ng mga 10 seconds or 5 seconds, that is the pulse oximeter or plethysmograph. So it identifies the volume in the body, such as blood or air. No, so but mainly it, uh, particularly it identifies the O2 or oxygen level in your blood. No, may mga certain devices din tayo that are able to have these detections. No, may mga Apple Watch, may mga smart watch rather. Tayo na pwede ka identify na SpO2 ng blood oxygen. Pero naman ibang smart watch na able to identify yung uh, heart rate natin, yung beating per second na mga sports watch. Okay. Even yung mga cellphone, minsan, di ba, yung mga Samsung S-series, yung S5, S6, S7, S8, 
Meron yung something sa likod na di, kapag dinidikit mo yung umiilaw ng red and it can identify your uh, BP, blood pressure rather. Uh, and the, the, I think yung heart rate. Okay. So, let's continue. Okay, now we will proceed to the invasive psychological methods in the humans. As you can see here, we have the invasive form or the techniques or methods that may include wounding or uh, doing some lesion or uh, cutting through the tissues or the skin. Okay, so first is uh, this method is usually done in non humans. First is the stereotactic surgery. So, stereotactic surgery is invasive form of surgical intervention. So, ito yung dito sa may rat sa top right. No? That makes uh, use of the three dimensional coordinate system, yung metal dyan na para pasi, to locate small targets inside the body and to perform on them some actions such as ablation, a biopsy, lesion, injection, stimulation, implantation, radiosurgery, SRS, etc. So, ang dami nyo pwedeng gawin. Pero usually talaga kung makita nyo yung daga dyan, inopen yung head part niya and nag-create sila ng uh, opening sa kanyang skull. So, how about is electrical simulation? Kung makita nyo dito yung daga sa lower left. Electrical stimulation is a type of physical therapy modality used to accomplish various tasks in physical therapy. If you have injury or illness that causes pain or limited functional mobility, such as yung stroke na nagre-recover, your physical therapist or PT may use electrical simulation or e steam as one part of your rehabilitation program. So yes, nag-therapy tayo, naglalakad-lakad, pero meron din minsan na additional help which is the uh, electrical stimulation. Tinutulungan na babuhay yung mga nerves natin doon. So, kung makikita dyan yung sa daga, ayan, meron tayong tinatawag na electrical knobs or nodes na uh, pwede nating uh, ma-identify or gamitin para mas stimulus for a certain type of behavior na gusto nating ma-identify. Okay. So, we also have the uh, electro-physiological recording. These are techniques that are used to record electrical activity of the neurons. Again, techniques that are used to record the electrical activity of the neurons. Okay. Next, uh, we'll continue on the lesioning techniques. We have what we call the aspiration lesion. So, ito yung aspiration uh, process dito sa top right na picture. So, aspiration is the image-guided picture of a cystic lesion. So, makita nyo dyan, meron tayo dyan ultrasound probe wherein ito yung image guide natin sa pag-inject ng needle. Okay. So, kapag inject yung needle, there could be a cystic lesion or such as cyst or abscess or bruising or a solid lesion, may masa ng laman. No? So, in order to remove a fluid or tissue, uh, kumukuha sila ng suction needle. So, itong needle, kumukuha siya kung may fluid yan, kung anong components ng fluid para mapag-aralan. So, the hollow aspiration needles, yung needle na ginamit, comes in different sizes and lengths. So, kapag ito ay medyo malalim, syempre mas mahabang needle din yung gagamitin. So, hinihigop niya yung fluid na nasa loob para ma-identify yung components or can be a solid form para malaman niya kung ano yung uh, component na ito ba cancerous o hindi. Next, we have here the radio frequency lesion. So, radio frequency lesion, ito yung nandito sa lower part, sa lower left. No? Ito yung parang may naka-insert sa head. So, radio frequency lesion is a procedure which special needle are used to create lesioning along uh, selective nerves. So, the needles uh, heat the nerve to 80 degrees about temperature of hot but not boiling water. So, when the heat is applied to a nerve for about 2 to 3 minutes, the nerve stops carrying pain signals. So, mainit siya, no? up to 80 degrees. Imagine yung 80 degrees na insert sa, sa utak ninyo. So, fun fact, so our brain do not have a, a pain receptors. So, walang pain na nararamdaman yung brain natin. Pero yung skin, before our brain, may pain yan. No, pero yung brain itself, walang pain yan. Okay. So, ayan. So, again, uh, itong radiofrequency lesions. So, aabot yan ng 80 degrees yung needle. Then, kapag na-reach na, na yun for 2 to 3 minutes, mag i yung nerves sa pag ng pain signal. Then, we also have here the cryogenic blockade. So, kapag nakita natin yung term na cryo, so, it is related to ice or very cold temperature. So, ito yung kabaliktaran naman ng radio frequency. So, there is a coolant that is pumped through an implanted cryoprobe. So, parang ganyan siya, may na-implant up cryoprobe, no? That cools down neurons until they stop firing. So, kabaliktaran siya ng radio frequency. Radio frequency is hot, 80 degrees. Ito naman ay cryogenic, ay very cold naman, no? Iba-block niya naman, parang nanam. Di ba natin na yung yellow, nakakapamanhid yun, okay? So, knife cuts, if you can see here, dito sa right, meron tayo ditong scalpel that is uh, cutting a skin of an individual. So, sorry, normal process na ginagawa kapag may surgery. No? If you are, if you could identify if you are a cesarean or a normal delivery baby uh, when you were on the past rather. So, normal lang yung knife cuts. No? 
So we also have here the chemical lesions or meron kasi mga specific types of chemicals or strong chemicals that can be used to wound no at a safe level no basta hindi rin naman strong amount kasi delikado rin naman kapag over yung amount ng chemical na ginamit natin okay let's proceed so basta sinabi natin lesion techniques mayroon dito ito ay invasive ito ay usually nag-incorporate ng wound no sa organism or sa tao next is genetic engineering genetic engineering, engineering is a very interesting uh, topic to be talked about so Genetic engineering is the process of using a recombinant DNA technology, but its definition mainly is to alter the genetic makeup of an organism. Again, genetic engineering is altering the genetic makeup of an organism. So genetic engineering involves the direct manipulation of one or more genes. So most often, a gene uh, from one species is added to an organism genome to give it a desired phenotype. So phenotypes, ito yung mga observable. No? Ito yung physical characteristics. No? So, usually kumukuha daw sila ng from another, ay lalagyan nila sa isa pang organism. So, one of the techniques that can be used here in genetic engineering is the gene knockout techniques. So, gene knockout technique is a technique by which the genomic DNA of a cell or a model organism is perturbed, no? So, that the expression of a specific gene is permanently prevented. So, nila knockout talaga yung genes nila. So, gene knockout methods, unlike knockdown method, damage specific genes, no? Ang ginagawa nila, ginagawa nilang non-functional yung genes na yun yung nananak out. Gene out technique, uh, technique and experimental technique that is used nga, uh, ginagawa ng defective na yung brain. So, or sometimes, it may create an organism that may lack a certain gene. So, may limitations naman to itong pag nanak out ng, uh, ng genes. No? So, most behavioral traits are influenced by activities of the multiple genes. So, elimination of a gene may modify the expression of other genes. So, ang limitations niya, may possibility daw na kapag meron kang dineactivate or ninock out na isang gene, maapektuhan yung other gene na functioning. For example, inalism yung pagiging mabait ng tao sa genes niya. So, ngayon, anong nangyari? Hindi na siya naging mabait at all. Laging matapang na siya. So, medyo decado rin naman yun. So, napakahirap ng genetic engineering. So, we also have here what we call the gene replacement techniques. So, gene replacement technique uh, has sometimes it's uh, creating no new or transgenic organisms so meron daw dito minsan na pinagsasama natin yung two separate species na hindi naman talaga meant to be for example uh, meron daw kinombine na gene na human genetic material such as yung ears nilagay yung ears ng isang tao or nagpagrow sila ng tenga ng tao sa likod ng mice or ng mouse but eventually the mouse died because the ear of the person become a parasitic ear where in absorb na yung nutrients na para dapat sa mice no so, are you in favor of genetic engineering? So, we have many food uh, products or products in the economy that are genetically modified such as yung 45 days sa chicken, yung mga kinakain yung chicken joy sa KFC, yung mga ganyan. No? So, yung mga uh, sweet corn, wherein sweet is not naturally that sweet or hindi siya ganun ka-yellow. So, for aesthetic value siya, for consumerism, so, ginawa nilang ganun yung jeans noon para uh, mas mabili, mas marami. No? yung pero minsan naman may mga positive traits din naman or positive din naman na nagagawa kapag tayo ay nag uh, genetic engineering no okay so meron minsan na discover na type of rice such as the golden rice na kayang i-withstand yung typhoon at hindi sila namamatay kahit malubog yung kanilang body sa baha okay so and uh, sometimes they are more nutritious okay, let's proceed so we have here what we call the animal uh, behavior paradigms so Paradigms, again, is a framework or a set of behavior that is followed by animals. We have what we call the species common behavior that we can find in almost all animals. No? We have here the aggressive behaviors. Itong aggressive behaviors, makikita to sa lahat ng phylum at saka kingdoms sa animals. We can look, uh, see this aggressive behavior in human, in animals, no? to protect themselves, to fight, no? to hunt. No? We also have the defensive behavior. Defensive behavior usually uh, settles in three. It's either they fight, they flight, or they freeze which is a normal response to physiological stress, no? So, yung anxiety paradigms, yung basis nila from anxiety, pwede ito yung maging pasyad kung sila ba itatakbo kapag merong uh, nangahabol. For example, yung ostrich, sa lion, yung zebra, may sumugod na cheetah, no? Sila ba itatakbo? Flight? Sila ba ilalaban kapag may mga anak sila? No? Lalabanan nila yung cheetah? Or sila ay mag-freeze at bigla silang matitigilan? No? That is their response. We also have a reproductive behavior in a sexual or asexual way. No, or in they have these uh, types of behavior. May mating rights tayo na tinatawag. No, may mga acts na similar. No, 
yung intromission they are uh, similar acts among all uh, species no so meron ding asexual they can uh, uh, impregnate themselves or they can fertilize their own egg such as yung may annual sign na pwedeng mangyari yun, such as yung aphids yung peste sa halaman sila ay pinanganak na pwede rin silang manganak no hindi nila hindi sila required na makahanap pa ng mate or makahanap pa ng papangasawa para magbuntis or mangitlog hindi ganoon ang aphids pinanganak sila na later on meron na rin silang itlog sa tiyan na pwede nilang ipanganak no so we also have the locomotor activities yung ways that a certain individual or a certain uh, animal may walk or uh, may move okay or move from one place to another Pero iba na for ang kanilang uh, arms or ang kanilang foot. No? So, they run. Yung iba, they fly. Locomotor activities, they have similarly, they have similarities among species because these are species common behavior. We also have here the traditional conditioning paradigms. So, these are paradigms or learning styles or behavior styles framework that are used to or that are learned to conditioning. So, first would be a Pavlovian or classical conditioning. If you could still remember uh, our last discussion or our last topic, I have uh, introduced to you Ivan Pavlov that is uh, popular for his uh, contribution with uh, learning, which is the classical conditioning. No? Yung ginamit yung aso. So, by two stimulus siya na in, uh, introduce sa aso, which is the bell and the food. No? Nakapag uh, niriring niya yung bell with the food, even though wala ng food, kapag na-condition na yung aso na every time nag-ring yung bell, may food, kahit wala ng food, magsasalivate yung aso. So, he measured the salivation, uh, he measured or identified the salivation as an indicator for learning. Okay? So, we also have here the uh, operant conditioning that is with its main proponent as B.F. Skinner or Buros F. Skinner. So, kung si Pavlov or Ivan Pavlov ay sa classical conditioning, sa operant conditioning, ang main proponent nito ay si uh, B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner. S-K-I-N-N-E-R. Okay. So, siya naman ang uh, major proponent nito. So, sinasabi dito na in operant conditioning, uh, a particular response is increased by a reinforcement or decreased by a punishment. So, yung behavior mismo, it will be reinforced or it will be decreased uh, with the use of the uh, punishments and rewards. Okay, so we also have here the common learning paradigms. First, let us talk about the condition taste aversion. So, if you look on the dictionary, ang definition ng aversion ay dislike or iwasan, repugnance. No? Parang ano, but when it's related to taste, so it comes with the learning about their food. So if you are familiar with the frogs, so nakakain na ba kayo ng palaka? So may may specific frogs na uh, edible or pwedeng kainin. But if you are also aware, there are there is what we call the toads or yung mga karag, which are somewhat not edible. May mga animals na kaya silang kainin, but uh, some animals uh, do not like eating toads because of the chemicals that they produce on their backs. If you're familiar, yung karag, di ba? Kapag tininigir sila or hinawakan sila or tinusok sila, may lumalabas na white fluid sa kanilang back part. And itong, back, itong fluid na to, itong mucus, sticky mucus na lumalabas sa likod, ay somewhat irritating at burning sa panlasa at hindi rin kaaya-aya yung panglasa sa, ng mga animals, sa mga panlasa ng animals. No? Kaya they learned that this is not something that they should eat. No? And nagkaroon sila ng tinatawag na condition taste aversion. Na-learn nila na kapag may nakita silang palaka, titignan mo na lang kung ito ay palaka or ito ay toad or ito ay karag. No? No? So, kapag na-learn na nila to, maiwasan nila na next time na kainin yung mga uh, toads na hindi naman kakain-kain. No? Actually, nakatulong din to para maiwasan din ng animals, minsan yung mga poisonous uh, plants or poisonous fruits, no? natututunan nila. So, there is also what we call the condition escape or avoidance. If you can see here, meron tayong dang usa. No? Uh, usually, yung usa, hindi naman sila kumakain na tuloy-tuloy na hindi pinapaan sa surroundings. Every time na kumakain sila, itinataas nila yung head nila para i-check yung paligid nila. Because during those times, possible na merong mga predators na papalapit sa kanila at pwede silang makain. No? So, they should learn or they should have a conditioning uh, that uh, there are times that they should uh, escape from that. And also, Meron silang mga particular na lugar na pwede lang ina-identify na dapat natin iwasan. So, paano natin ito marirelate kapag sa, sa 
sa human, no? Yung condition escape or avoidance. Kapag nakasanayan kang dumaan sa kanto nyo, no, na naglalakad at okay lang, walang problema. Pero kapag yung kanto nyo ay punong-puno ng aso at may ibang daanan na walang aso, ang mangyari, makukondisyon tayo na iwasan yung normal nating daanan kasi ang dami dong aso. No? Unless ikaw ay batang matapang. No? Naharapin mo yung mga aso yun, even though it poses a threat. No? We also have what we call the conditioned place preference. There are specific uh, animals that shows a paradigm where they prefer a specific place. For example, we have here the eagle. They prefer to be on the higher ground or in the air because it gives them a wide range of perspective when they are hunt hunting. No? or when they are looking for their prey. Again, kapag sila ay nasa upper ground, literally upper ground, no, uh, mas madali lang malolocate or mahanap kung saan nila uh, hahuntingin or huhulihin yung kanilang next uh, prey, which is sometimes yung mga rabbit. No? But also the rabbit has what they call the place preference. Usually they uh, forage on the ground or naghanap sila ng pagkain sa ground since doon din malapit yung tinatawag natin holes nila or burrows. No? They live usually underground and it's a safe place for them from the eagles that may eat them. So kapag papalapit yung eagle at na-identify nila, ginagawa nila, they run and they hide on their burrows. Where in their burrows, hindi naman nakapasok yung mga eagle. No? Okay. So next we have here another common learning paradigm which is the regal arm maze. Itong regional arm maze, ito yung nakikita natin katabi ng eagle. Ito yung nakikita natin dyan, no? So, it is used to study foraging behaviors in laboratory, no? Foraging is yung paghahanap ng food ng mga rodents or animals. Because foraging in wild is complex, no? Hindi naman ganun kadali na maghanap ng, ano, ng uh, pagkain sa wild, no? Kailangan may specific minsan location, no? So, the rat must learn where the food is likely to be, but not to an immediate uh, revisit na parang hindi nila agad-agad malalaman yon unless pinuntahan talaga nila. So, in the regional arm maze, uh, rats quickly learn to go directly to the arms that are baited with food each day. So, kapag nilagay mo yung isang part na may food doon, alam na nila kahit ilagay mo sa the next day na yun yung lugar na may food. no? Uh, for example, kapag repeated yung trial nila. Okay? So, similar yun sa wild, no? Meron mga specific parts or place sa gubat or for example, yung bee na alam niya na marami doon na bulaklak. So, doon siya pupunta. So, it is a condition, a common learning paradigm for them. Kapag nalaman nila na maraming food dito or dito yung may food, doon kami pupunta. So, we also have here the Morris Water Maze. Morris Water Maze, as you can see here, ito yung nasa center picture. So, uh, kung di, not, di siya ganun clear, meron dyang white rat or lab rat na lumalangoy sa isang milky water, sa isang tub. Okay. So, it is a, another laboratory paradigm used to study the rat's spatial ability or spatial ability. The Morris Water Maze is a large tub of milky water so, to get out of the water, rats must learn to swim to a slightly submerged and visible goal platform. So, may specific part dyan na medyo pwede nilang tungtungan na nakasubmerge na ng sa tubig. No? So, inaalam nila dito yung special location, special memory ng mga cat. So, learn, rats learn to do this very quickly. Even when they are placed in the water at a different position on each trial, they use external room cues to guide them to go to that specific place. So, pinag talagang sila ang ginagamit para mapag-aralan. Okay? So, it is interesting to look at their search strategies when the platform has been moved to a new location. Let's proceed. Okay, operant conditioning. So, these are one of the tools or apparatus that is used in operant conditioning. We have here three buttons. May isang button dyan yung nasa gitna that when pressed, it will release a food or pellets, food pellets. Yung isa dyan ay mag-release ng electrical shock sa kanilang paa at yung isang button dyan ay mag-release ng very hot air or very cool cool or cold air. No? So, syempre, ano bang gugusayin ng rat dyan? Yung punishment or yung rewards? So, ang pipiliin dyan ng rat is yung rewards which is yung center. So, kapag na-learn ng rat yun na yun yung nag-release ng food so, malalearn na yun no? na kapag pinapress ko itong button na to may reward ako na food pellet. Okay? So, we also have here the condition place preference apparatus. So, ang ginamit naman nila dito ay hamsters. So, may isa dyan na colder temperature, may isang warmer condition uh, or warmer temperature side where eh, titignan nila kung ano mas prefer na side ng hamsters. And eventually, hamster, hamsters would prefer the warmer side. No? Probably because they are mammals and they uh, are not uh, well-versed with regards to cold temperatures. Ayan, ito yung sample ng regional arm maze na pinakita natin kanina. Okay. I hope that it's not yet. So, ito yung, again, example for Rachel Arm Maze. So, my food pellets dyan na pinaplace sa end of each arm. 
So, tinitignan din, no? nag-create yung rat ng spatial cues kung saan doon yung part na may pagkain talaga. Kahit every day siya nilalagay doon. And last year, we have an open field apparatus. No? Kung saan nakita natin yung kung saan specific uh, binababa or itinataas ibinababa para siyang maze no? na ma-identify ng mga rats yung specific way para makalabas sila doon sa maze nila, itong open field apparatus. Okay, so that would be all. If you have questions, you can ask me directly. No, uh, thank you for listening today and I hope that uh, I will see you on our next topic. Okay, thank you and God bless you guys.